Show. It is your Monday edition. Happy Monday, everybody. Chris, I see you're becoming a regular on this show. Good to see my friend Chris from NorCal on the program. Yes, Randall's suffering through his 78, 73 degrees. Yeah, it's, it's kind of tough. To, the, the airplanes are distraction this beautiful day down here in Southern California. Hello, Jeff, Jerry, Mario, Siraj, Big Eb, good to have you with us. Dana, Ivzy, Les, Sue, and uh, Les is always the first one to class. He's always the first one to make a comment, so good to see you with us, Les. Um, today's show, obviously, we've got a ton of stuff to talk about. We'll talk about NVIDIA. We'll talk about cryptocurrencies. We'll talk about some of the other other major market moves. I can see here that uh, we've got questioning. Is this a relief rally for Mario? Uh, possibly. I'll look at that. But I want to get to the topic at hand, which is this. Stock splits. Stock splits. How do they work? This is because I've received multiple questions over the past couple weeks. Uh, it really was started with IBM and their talk about a spinoff. Not necessarily a split, but a spinoff company. And then you have the GE announcement that came out talking about their split, which is happening soon. So I thought, you know what, let's just once and, all, once and for all do a show on stock splits so we understand the mechanics, the math behind it so that you don't get screwed by it, what happens with those. So the question was uh, from Brian says, can you explain how stock splits work? I have shares of GE. All right, well, the reason this is somewhat important is GE made an announcement for their stock split, which is gonna happen August 2nd. Now, this is a big difference between what's happening with GE and what happened with something like Tesla or Apple. And I'll go through and show you some price charts here, but let me start things off by showing just what GE price chart looks like. So here's GE on the daily, looking weak over the past couple weeks, but if you look back to, as, as everything, with this COVID rally, you know GE certainly hasn't had the same I guess robust move that we've seen the overall market do, right? It's, this is a monthly time frame. It's been pretty ugly. Yes, it has had a rally from those lows, but sitting at $13.19 right now is a long way off from its 2016 high of over 30 bucks. So let me first, before we go into explaining why the split happens or how the mechanics behind the scenes work, I've got to cover two things. Number one is why does this company do a split? If a company does a split, it's generally because either the price is too expensive or too cheap. For me, this borders a lot with psychology. When you look at something like you know your Amazon, which is uh, again, continuing to soar, although today was a little bit of a down day, thank goodness, but at $3,453, a lot of people look at the share price of Amazon and go, I can't afford Amazon. I don't wanna buy a share of Amazon. It's too expensive, right? I, I, I wanna buy something that's cheap because it has a higher probability of moving to the upside. Well, that's not true. Right, a lot of times people get this one get it wrong, which is one share of Amazon is going to be the same as ten shares of a three hundred and forty dollars stock, or a hundred shares of a thirty four dollars stock, or a thousand shares of a three dollar and forty five cent stock. So it's it's all relative. So when we look at something like uh, GE. Right, GE clearly has had some struggles over the past few years, not looking so great, and the price is down around $13. So what happens is they'll try to make this look a little bit better by jacking that price back up and making it look like a, a bigger company. Because again, the psychology is at 13 bucks, oh, it's cheap, it might not be the greatest company. If you reverse this, and they're gonna do an eight for one reverse split. So if you look at that, it'd put it right around $105 right now on GE. So let me walk through the mechanics of how that works from the reverse split side, because that's what GE is doing, is, is a reverse split. And then you look at something like what Tesla and Apple did recently, which is a full split, meaning they're taking one existing share and turning that into multiples, two, three, four, five, whatever. So let me walk you through a visual of how all this works, and then give you an idea of the three important dates that you need to remember if you are involved in a stock split and what those uh, events and dates mean. So we'll start things off with the first one, which is the announcement date. This is simply the official date that that company says, okay, we're going to do a stock split and they'll give you uh, another date. So really the announcement date is not that big of a deal. It's just the time they first make it look public and let everybody know that they're gonna have that stock split. So no big deal there. That's what GE just did. Then they have what's called the record date. Now the record date means on the specific date of record, anybody who owns those shares will receive on the next date we're gonna talk about here, they'll receive whatever that split may be. So let's say for example, it's a two for one split. For every one share you had, you get two shares. 
on the record date, they basically take a snapshot and whoever owns those shares on that date and forward will receive on the X date, which is the EX date, some call it the execution date, some call it the um, delivery date. The X date is what most people call it, is the date when that split becomes effective. So really, if you've owned it after the record date, the date that X date happens is when you own it. Let's look at a visual to make it clear. So if we look at two different examples here, the first one, is let's say today is June 21st, 2021. Conveniently, it is June 21st. Look how, talk about up to date charts and data. Damn, I'm good. If the X date, meaning when that official split will happen, is June 30th, 2021, that's when those shares split will be effective. <clears throat> now, let's say it's a five for one split. That means for every share that you get, or every share that you had, you will receive five shares. So if you had 100 shares, you'd now get 500 shares. If you had one share, you'd have five shares, etc. So we'll go further down this list. Let's say you're currently long 100 shares of whatever stock this is, and the current price is $100. All right, so what happens is we move forward to now, all of a sudden it's June 30th, right? It's that date, the X date. We're now officially upon it. What happens? Well, what will happen is it's basically a, a logistics transaction in the back end. You don't have to do anything. Your brokerage firm and the clearing firms behind the scene will do all the work. So instead, you wake up and you're like, all of a sudden you see 500 shares in your account. Of course, that's going to make you freak out. Like, yeah, I got 500 shares. Well, yeah, you have 500 shares, but they're also going to divide the current price by five. So you notice that you have those two numbers up. 100 times 100 is 10,000. If you take 500 times 20, that's also 10,000. So they're gonna balance out and basically be equal. That's that's the effect of a, a standard split. Now this is what GE, uh, this is not what GE do, is doing. This is what Tesla recently did. This is what Apple recently did where they say, you're gonna get five shares for every one that you own. Now, if you look at a reverse split, this is what GE is doing. So for those that do own GE, uh, this might freak you out a little bit when it finally does get implemented. Now. I don't have the exact dates, I'm just using this as an example, but let's assume again it's the 21st of June and the X date for this specific split will be June 30th. Let's say it's a one for 10. That means for every 10 shares you own, you get one, right? That's a reverse split. And, and again, one of the reasons they'll do this, a lot of stocks can become delisted if they get too low in price. So what you see is certain stocks will get down to let's say two or three bucks. If they stay there for a long enough time, the exchanges can literally remove them and now they become bulletin board stocks. And they don't want that because there's an air of prestige to be on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. So they want to stay there. So what will happen is generally they will, they will do a reverse split. Um, there was a company called Heliomathis New York, HMNY. I'll bring a chart up for that. This is a great one. Uh, HMNY. Heliomathis has been doing reverse splits like you wouldn't believe. I mean, look at the share price of this thing. Right? Do you really think that HMNY made it all the way up to a high price of $9,714 and is currently trading at two tenths of a penny? No, it did not. They've been doing reverse splits over and over, or, um, yeah, reverse splits, trying to get this share price back up. This is does the movie pass thing, which <laughs> think a movie pass is doing good right now? Not so good. So reverse splits can seriously distort a chart like it did here with HMNY, but this was, I think they did like a thousand to one reverse split and then a 500 to one reverse split, it was crazy. So to go back to this example, let's say it's a 10 to one reverse split, meaning for every 10 shares you had, you now get one share and let's assume that you had 500 shares. Well, after, and current price was 10 bucks. So you had 500 shares at $10. After this split on June 30th, this individual would have 50 shares and you probably freak out like, wait a minute, I thought that I had 500 shares. No, because it's a 10 to one, you only have 50 shares now. The good news for you though is that the price will have increased by 10. So you got 50 shares of a $100 stock now and it's just gives it more of a, a real price point than something at 10 bucks. Keep forgetting there is a time difference for your lives. Yes, Isabel, where are you at? Yes, we're, well, I'm on the California coast here. We got we do have people from all over the world today, that's for sure. But um, so that's your your split and reverse split. Now, for the gentleman who was asking about the GM split, or sorry, the GE split, that's going to be one for eight. So it's kind of a weird one. Um, basically, for every eight shares you own, you're going to get one of the new shares, which will be eight times higher than what it currently is. 
So if we look at the price point here, we'll go to GE, and you'll look and you say, okay, it's at $13. Well, remember, that's gonna be times eight. And of course, it'll be the night before it splits. So this price point will most likely change. But let's say you own GE and it's gonna, it's gonna change tomorrow, right? Let's just make the assumption. It's actually August 2nd is the date, but I'm just using it for an example for here. If it was tomorrow, then this would come in and we'll could bust our calculator out here and it's pretty simple. Where did my calculator go? Well, I had a calculator all set and ready to go, but I guess that's not gonna work for us. So we'll bring it up here. Uh, let's see, eight times uh, 13, 19, 13.19. That means that tomorrow it'd be $105.52 is basically where this price point would be if this had a ten, uh, an eight to one split tomorrow. And if you had 80 shares, you would only have eight shares of it. Okay, that's the weird little, the flip. Uh, all right, well, you know, I thought you maybe you're in the other part of the world, Isabel. Well, welcome from St. Pete. Hope you're having a great day out there. So I'm hoping that for the gentleman sending that question, that was from, let me get the name right, um, from Brian, that that gives you a little bit of an understanding of how exactly those splits work. Now, to me, they are, again, they're very psychological. And the thing that I remember vividly from my very active trading days when I was just nothing but financial markets in my world in the late 90s, I noticed there was an interesting phenomenon. If it was a stock that was being beaten down, that has just been kind of falling out of, of favor for whatever reason, you know, just not doing well, not performing well, if it was on a downtrend and it got so cheap, they tend to do a, they would tend to do a reverse split like what GE is doing. And again, the goal of that is they want to keep the price point high enough so it doesn't get delisted but they also want to keep it high enough so it looks like a legit stable real company, right? Most people aren't these Reddit Wall Street bets fools who are just taking gamble flyers every single trade they make. It's about most people that are doing this successfully are looking at price and understanding price action as opposed to somebody's post in a social media chat room. So you don't want to have a $10 stock in your portfolio. It's better to have something like the 50 or $100 mark. Now, the other way, which I've noticed, so by the way, when, when those like GE does a reverse split like this, normally they're doing a reverse split because they want to save themselves again from being delisted. I found more often than not that even though they split, prices still tend to drift down, right? You're still, it's a sinking ship, yet they're splitting a sinking ship. Doesn't usually uh, bode well. Not to say that it can't bring it back to prosperity, but um, usually from my experience, a downtrending stock that does a reverse split still trends down. That said, what did we see with Apple? What did we see with Tesla when they did their splits? A normal split. They were already trending strong to the upside, so they're doing a split to capitalize on that momentum. And part of it is the share price was, you know, five hundred dollars. I think it was more than that. Wasn't it two thousand dollars when they did their split? I think I think Tesla was over two thousand dollars a share, and then they did a five to one if I'm not mistaken, it brought it down to like 400 and something dollars per share. Again, it's capitalizing on that momentum, that uptrend, and when you do something like that, everybody wants to own that security anyway, but now you do a split and it becomes, oh, I can now own four times as much or five times as much, whatever that split may be. So generally, if something is trending strong to the upside and they do a split, it will continue to the upside. If it's trending down and they do a reverse split, it's gonna continue trending down. That's just my personal experience. How do reverse splits of Fed options contracts? Um, they're just, they're both adjusted. So a standard split and a reverse split will just be adjust, adjusted. So your contract, let's say it was um, an eight to one, like you're seeing with um, uh, GE, right? I'm gonna make sure I get my numbers right. So if GE, if you buy one options contract and that's supposed to control 100 shares, you simply divide that by eight. Right, so that would give you uh, what 12.5 shares technically is how many shares your option would be controlling. Now I don't know how it does it with the half price thing that I don't know, um, but they adjust the amount of shares that your options track control options contract controls, and then they also adjust the share price in the same way. So those specific options contracts get modified to accommodate for not only the split share adjustment but the split price adjustment, both long and short. Yeah, Big Ab, I agree. It says trying to gain credibility with reverse splits really works it out, it seems. I agree. I, I haven't seen it work out too well. And, and it's funny because we have this idea that, oh, well, it's split. It's going to be great. 
it is if it's going up. It is if it's strong trending. You know, like I, I could definitely see Amazon doing a split right now simply because I feel like they're stuck in a sideways rut. Um, but Tesla did it the perfect time. Your share price is soaring, your momentum's there, do a stock split there, and you'll push up even further, which is what happened. And I think it went absolutely great. <laughs> great one, Jerry. I love the comments. You got my, you're like my color commentary. I love it. Jerry says, Titanic split in half just hours before it sank like GE. Yeah, it's funny. I used to make fun of GE because their slogan used to be, we bring good things to life. Yes, I'm showing my age. Uh, it seems if you look at their share price, like it's more like we, we put our share price to death. But hey, you know what? It's gone from uh, six bucks up to 14 in uh, a year and a half. So okay, if you're long on GE, uh, I guess you're doing all right. Okay. Let's see what else I Splits can make the options price very strange for a while. Yeah, it's, it's fractions and numbers. Yeah, I, I have not personally held an options contract through a split. Uh, I'll generally dump things before that happens. But, you know, for example, if you have right now the GE August, uh, you know, third week of August options contract, which, you know, that you could very easily have that if you're a seller and you're looking at three months out, um, what's well, August 20th would be that expiration. If you have the GE August 20th right now, you may consider getting out before the 2nd of August because after the 2nd of August, it will have to readjust everything. It could get wonky and look weird. Personally, I just would just get out of it, but I haven't I haven't held an expiration of options um, through a split personally, but I, I'm sure nothing dangerous is gonna happen. They just simply readjust it to accommodate for the different uh, price and positions. All right. Cool. So, Brian, I hope that I answered your question there on stock splits and reverse splits. Um, I love them. I think they're a great thing. I've had them happen to me many times as a shareholder, but never as an options guy. Whether you're long or short, buying puts or calls, doesn't matter. They simply adjust it on the back end so your options contract would control more or less depending on the split and the um, strike price as well, as well would be adjusted. All right, any other questions there? Anybody else? Uh, regular splits make the options more palatable, less expensive per contract. Yeah, and it's it's not, it's not twofold, right? Again, Big Ev, you're looking at the options side of things, but remember, I would say that the vast majority of people aren't trading options. You wanna keep the share price palatable, you know? So remember, we didn't have fractional investing. You couldn't go out there and say, hey, give me 10 bucks worth of Amazon. It's trading at 3,400 bucks. You're buying a full share. You can't buy fractional. Now you can buy fractional. So that's changed it a little bit. When I was in the markets, you didn't have, or in the markets, when I was trading in the late 90s, there were no fractional shares. If you wanted to buy one share, you had to pony up for one share. And so anything that got really expensive just made it cost prohibitive. And those companies didn't see as much liquidity. So all of a sudden what we do with these splits is you drop, you know, Let's say Amazon. Amazon could easily, and my guess is they will do a 10 to one split. If Amazon did a 10 to one split, um, for every share you had, you get 10 times that. So your share price would drop from $345, or sorry, $3,453 to $345. It would just be cut in by, divided by 10. So that makes it much easier and more palatable for people to trade options. It would divided by 10. So that makes it much easier and more palatable for the average person to go and say buy a full share of Amazon. So that was the tactic back then. I mean, hell, Amazon could probably do a tw do 100 for one, which would be nuts to see Amazon do 100 for one. And, and think about what happens. Just put, a, your, you put your, th your average consumer cap on, not your trader's cap on, but let's say you saw an item that was trading for, or you could go buy this item for um, $300 right, 300 bucks, but you walk by it the next day and it's trading at 30. Your brain instantly goes, oh hell, I'm gonna go buy a bunch of that, right? Because it's yesterday it was 300, now it's only 30. And that's what I think is one of the catalysts for these stock splits is when that happens, a lot of people the next day, after the X date, see that it's split and all of a sudden they want to, they're excited because, wow, it was 300 bucks yesterday, it's 30 today, I'm gonna buy myself a thousand shares or something. It's a perceived value, a benefit that a lot of people like to jump on. And I'll tell you what, if, if Amazon, which again is at $3,400 right now, was trading at $34, a lot of people would jump on that one and be like, hey, I'm buying myself some Amazon. And you would see price move back up. Uh, Medic says, I held the options contract with, ooh, okay, VXX. They made a separate category instead of 100 shares. Hmm. 
VX is a standard 100 for one contract. Now there's a separate contract for 25 for one contract because it reverse split forward one. Right. So, but you didn't have to do anything on that medic, right? That was all back end. So I think I think what I want to do is abate some fears here and calm people down because uh, I think last week we had somebody freaking out about IBM's upcoming split and and the GE split. Relax, right? If you own shares, if you own options contract, it will all adjust back end. We don't have to do anything as the consumer. Now on that note, um, just so I can explain the difference here, with GE you're getting an eight to one reverse split, right? So every um, eight shares you have, you now get one, which sounds like a bad deal, but the price of that share is gonna jump by eight as well. I wanna correct something, because Apple or um, IBM is not really doing a split, right? Apple, or IBM, I wanna keep saying Apple, IBM is doing a spin-off. They're splitting the company. It's not necess not technically a a stock split in the traditional sense like I've just been explaining where the regular and reverse split. They're doing a spin-off. And from my understanding right now, there's going to be two separate companies. One is going to be about 3 quarters the value of an IBM share. The other one will be about 1 quarter of it, right? Because the current value of IBM apparently is um, well, the first spinoff will be a company that has $60 billion worth of value, and the second one would be the spinoff of a company that has about $20 billion worth of value that I think is gonna be called Kendrel, K-E-N-D-R-Y-L will be the new company. So you're gonna now see in your account the same amount of IBM shares and I believe the same amount of Kendrel shares. So if you had 100 shares of IBM, you'd also have 100 shares of Kendrel. Now what'll happen is, your IBM shares are gonna drop by 25%. And you're like, well, why? Well, because 25% of the value of the, the current IBM today will be spun off into Kendrel, and you're getting those shares. So when you combine the Kendrel shares and IBM together, you would get the value of what IBM was the day before that spinoff, if that makes sense. So it's almost like a split, except you're getting two separate companies as opposed to one company. So IBM is going to be different. There is There has not been a, a determined date yet on IBM. They've said that it will be by the end of 2021. I don't know if I did a million to one reverse split, but uh, they could. <laughs> a million to one might be a little tough. That'd be something like for HMNY, Helium Mathis, New York, are these, these sub penny stocks they're trying to keep listed. All right, so I got that one out of the way. What else? Um, So Scott, and if you have questions on the splits, let me know. That was just kind of a quick overview of it. Uh, I think one of the reasons I did this is just because a lot of people have misconceptions of how splits work. They freak out. They think they have to do all kinds of stuff. You don't have to do anything. You just gotta check your bank or check your brokerage firm accounts. It's all handled on the back end. Again, I would certainly uh, know your positions because I'm one of those people that I just don't trust the financial markets. And again, we did see issues with something like uh, Dole when they went private because of the underwriting, uh, the dates of expiration, record dates, the DTCC was actually off on some of their accounting. So just know exactly what you have. So when that split X date does show up, you know I should have this amount at this price. Um, hmm. Yeah, well, Jerry says, what the hell is with this Berkshire Hathaway stock valued over 400,000? This is the, the poster of a split 100 to one. It is, but um, he says he'll never split a stock. So, and remember, Buffett's not concerned. I don't think Buffett's concerned at all with the value of Berkshire Hathaway. He's concerned with running a company and making sure, not just running the company anymore, but making sure that this thing continues to grow and make good investments. So, he said a long time ago he's not going to split it. You know, Amazon may never split either. Who knows? But again, if you're if you're a shareholder, you want it to be split. It would be more attractive for the retail population to come in and buy more of it, just from a psychological low price point level. Yeah, Berkshire Hathaway. They actually did, they had a Berkshire Junior, there was an A shares and B shares of Berkshire, and I think the Berkshire Bs were one-tenth of the value. What do you feel only one share of GE? Do you give a, <laughs> ML, that is a great question. And it's funny, because I've was i been so busy today, I knew that question was gonna come up, and I was like, I should probably research that. I don't know, my assumption would be, that they would close it out and go give you cash. But that's my assumption. I don't know if you have one share of something and it does, yeah, like an eighth, like with GE, like, you know, what are you gonna do? I get one eighth? I, it's a great question, ML. Let me look into that. Uh, I meant to do it before today's show, but I just got wrapped up in so many things. So I knew you, I knew someone was gonna ask me, ML did it. Um, 
Yes, and I believe that that is actually part of it, Big Eb. Not that it's riffraff like you, but I believe he wants it to be, you know, people with money buying into it. And oh, there you go. <laughs> I have one share. Oh wow. <laughs> well, let me know what happens with that ML. <laughs> I want to know. <clears throat> oh. All right, let me go to uh, Scott's here. So this is uh, Scott asked for a cryptocurrency update. Says getting killed. Yeah, a lot of people are getting killed. And if you look at the technicals on it right now, it it really doesn't look good. Um, obviously, I'm a long term bull on it. I did buy some more today, and um, yeah, it's been a, especially the last week has been really ugly. We had that initial drop back on the you know mid May, uh, which was aggressive. But this one, this is shaping up to potentially drop even more. And I'll show you show you some price charts here. Um, obviously, the big daddy out there is Bitcoin and we have this $30,000 mark as a target, right? Not only was this a, a nice psychological number, but it also was an area of demand. Let me see if I can, oh my God, I always use the wrong tools here. You can see going back here into 2021, that January, February point, 30,000 was kind of a, a base point. And you know, I'm looking at that as kind of a, a target to, to bounce off of, I'll go a little higher, there's 30,000. You know, if we get below that and get a close below 30,000, I think you could see a lot more downside movement in this. Remember, a lot of this is piped off of expectations, and there is a little bit of a negative air going on right now. Um, certainly, cryptocurrencies that do things, that have utility, that have function, like like Polkadot, like Cardano, like uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin, these are being used. If it's garbage like Dogecoin and Shiba Coin and all these crap coins with porn names, garbage, good, they deserve to go away. Honestly, they, they, they really deserve to... Uh, get smoked these junk coins it, it's a question of how viable you believe some of these products are you know so for example i bought some more polka dot today uh, it's down 20 percent today i mean that's this that's a brutal haircut out there so uh, you know i added to my position because i think polka dot in the long term will probably do pretty well but again that's that's a gamble you know i also have purchased some recently that have dropped significantly and i don't know if they're going to come back Luckily, they're very small portions of my portfolio, but the picture is pretty gloomy here for almost all of these. If you notice that EOS, for example, we're coming right back down down in these levels around 350 that it bottomed out back in May, and you know if it gets below that, you, th there's a slow drift down here. What's what's the catalyst to push it up? Do I think the China crackdown is the cause? I think that's part of it. Uh, but what you're seeing is those mining operations just simply move to other places, so they'll actually. Uh, Austin, Texas. Oh man, I sold my house in Austin, Texas. I can't believe it. I paid 205 for this house. I, I can't remember. I want to say it was in 2005 or 2006 or something. It was it was a while. But I think I bought it in 2006. Oh, man, seems like forever ago. Um, paid 205. I sold it for 360, like in 2010, 2012. So I did pretty well. And I just looked at it today. And it was eight hundred and eleven thousand dollars. Like, man, got to keep those real estate investments. Oh well, shoulda, coulda, woulda. It's funny. I also looked at the first house I ever bought in Lake Tahoe today, <laughs> and uh, I sold that house for one hundred and twenty-nine thousand dollars, and it's it's got a, an eight hundred and ninety or sorry, a nine hundred and eleven thousand dollar price on it right now. Why wow, you got to keep those long-term investments? Um, anyway, yes, I do think that um, part of it has to do with China. It's just spreading that fud, that fear, uncertainty, and doubt. However, those operations are moving around the world. I mean, they're not going to just sit there and say, okay, well, this is all wasted equipment. They'll find ways to move it to places where they can set up shop. Um, if It's funny because if you look at the distribution map of hashing power, you can see that it's all around the world. And even though China has all these bans, there's still plenty of, of mining going on in China. They're just going after the big ones, but it's hard to shut everybody down. Uh, Randall says, but you have to look. I actually liked Austin. I really liked Austin. Um, I was very fortunate. My father bought some real estate with some uh, inheritance money that I received many, 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 many moons ago. And I like Austin. I love Sixth Street. I like the, the social atmosphere. I love the, I just love it. It's just the temperature is a little bit wild for me. And, you know, it's it's Texas. So it's a little bit different than what I'm used to, but it's not too bad. I like Austin. And you got the Lakeway. You got the Lake Travis out there. It's fun. Okay. So that's pretty much it on the crypto update. I don't really have much more. I mean, I, I think that it's it's looking ugly right now. You know, I, I, I it's funny because I expected there to be a big pullback in crypto. You guys remember the show? I was like, yeah, I dumped all my Ethereum. I dumped all my Litecoin. 
and I ended up buying back in. I just didn't think it would come back down this far, you know. So I, I feel fortunate that I got out uh, and bought back in, but boy, you know, that thing's just cratered. Um, really pretty ugly across the board. I still am long-term bullish on it, but you know, you have um, uh, a certain meltdown going. And it, there, there's a lot of people saying that it's China. I think the primary reason for this is the systems put up in place by DeFi. Now, this is something I'm building into the class I'm making for Online Trading Academy, but if you think about it, one of the newer phenomenons has been leverage in the cryptocurrency space, not just on exchanges, but what you can do on decentralized exchanges where you can deposit some cryptocurrency assets, immediately take out margin on that essentially and go buy right back in the same thing so just like a bank can do fractional reserve banking you could do the same thing with your cryptocurrency assets you deposit ethereum you take some out then you buy more ethereum then you buy more ethereum you buy more and all of a sudden your 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 initial ten thousand dollar ethereum investment could be twenty thousand dollars right you could or, or more depending on what your uh, margin rate is so it's interesting to see the leverage side of it and what's happening I personally believe this is just a squeeze. I think that this is to get everybody to get stopped out, if you will, that those people who over leveraged and really margin themselves to the hilt, they're getting destroyed right now. And I'm not, I, I'm using zero leverage. I don't ever plan on using leverage in the crypto. I think it's risky enough that I don't really need leverage. Um, but I think that that's part of the reason you're seeing this really aggressive decline is the shorting aspect of it, that people are using margin and then all of a sudden they're getting called on their margin, they have to liquidate positions and that further speeds up the process. And I think that that's created a lot of uh, just negative vibe out there in the cryptocurrency space and that, that's that's pretty much me. Well, that's, that's your opinion, Gregory. You can feel free to um, go to Peter Schiff's channel and join his uh, disdain for it, but you're not gonna find uh, an amicable crowd here. Most of us believe that there's long-term prospects for cryptocurrencies, so you can hate all that you would like. Texas should secede? Yeah, well, I think they've been trying to for a long time. Rogelio, good question, how low could it go? Well, I mean, ultimately we know the, the true answer, which nobody wants to hear, it could go to zero. Right, I mean that's that's the truth of the matter. It could go to zero. However, I look at something like Ethereum um, and Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin has too many factors going for it, so I don't think it could. I don't think it will go to zero unless somebody cracks the the algorithm, which would be SHA two fifty six. So I think you're safe there. Some of these are like Shiba Coin, Dogecoin, the, those could go to zero, and and I wish that they would. I wish that those would go to zero and just get wiped out and and call it a day. Um, you know, it's different when you look at the technical analysis side of it. So if I'm looking at Litecoin here, so you guys can see the Litecoin chart, if I scroll back, you know, where should Litecoin be? And one of the things that we'd be using as a long-term investor is something like a moving average. And I guess one of the easy ones would be to use a, let's say a 200 period moving average. So let me just throw one on here and we'll throw a moving average and I'll make it a 200. Oops, okay. And let's change this setting. Sorry, I got to do this. I'm not used to using this platform, but I don't get cryptos on TradeStation like that. Um, even if you did a 200 period moving average, it's telling you to get out, right? Uh, Big Ebb says 27,000 could happen for Bitcoin. Sadly, I, I hate to say it, as long as I am on Bitcoin, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, the only saving grace here is if you look at the technical analysis, let me just get some of these lines out of here um, and get rid of this nine period. It's a 50. Um, you look at this 200 period moving average, right now it's still trending up, which for all intents and purposes, it's it's okay. You know I mean, you want it to be trending up. So it's not dead. It's just price is now below that 200 period moving average. And this is gonna be the same for every crypto. I don't think this um, Ripple just, just broke below its 200 period moving average today. So, you know, all of these are looking, well, uh, Cardano is not below it, it's still trending up, looking good. But you know that's the, usually the thinking is these will come back down to its 200 period moving average and bounce. You're not seeing that right now with um, with a lot of these cryptocurrencies. They're actually well below their 200 period moving average. Like Polkadot, Ethereum is actually at it right now, bouncing at it, bounced off it today. Bitcoin below it. So um, I think it can go considerably lower. Rogelio, it's it's sad to say because I have a sizable portfolio of cryptocurrencies, um, but it's all right. Uh, you know, again, I'm not I'm not holding these for next week. I'm holding these for years. These will be long-term position holds for me, uh, based off the my belief that decentralized finance 
uh, and that entire ecosystem will grow to be something substantial in a period of years. But again, it has to, it's going to take time. It's going to go through a lot of ups and downs, a lot of volatility um, along the way. It's just the nature of the beast when we have something that's so new and facing so many challenges. All right, let's see. Uh, my son put five bucks in Doge, going to make four hundred bucks still last summer. <laughs> Yeah, might want to lock in some might want to lock in some profits. Um, you know, Dogecoin doesn't have a lot of use cases. Yeah, Jerry Bitcoin chart looks uh, bearish for the short term. Yeah, totally agree. You know, it does look very bearish. And here's you know, if we if this was anything else, you take off the fact that this is Bitcoin and call this any normal stock. You guys all know what my comments would be. I'd be looking at this right now saying, guys, it's below its 200 period moving average. You can see that that uptrend, which was in place, really seems to be broken. It's been consolidating. Let's pull the infamous yellow box, which I love to put on my charts. Where's the, I'm not used to the drawing tools in this bad boy. No, 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 no. Unfortunately, I don't know where the yellow box is on this one. I don't use it too often. Mm. Oh well, I'll, I'll see if I can put a yellow box later on. But you know, you've got this yellow box between thirty and call it forty thousand dollars on Bitcoin. Yeah, it's a twenty-five percent range, but until it breaks out of this, you kind of should just sit on your hands. Um, it does look like you know if you're looking at buying at thirty. That's okay. I don't see a problem buying Bitcoin at thirty simply because it feels like it's range bound. Let's put this top line down here to make the range. All right, right about roughly there. I, w I could keep the peaks in here, but it just makes it for easy numbers. Let's call it right there. So it looks to be about 41,030, right? So you've got that range. And just like we were looking at on Amazon or other markets, play the range. I mean, look, remember we talked about the Russell 2000? So let's go to IWM. I mean, I still have the yellow box on this bad boy, or had the yellow box. Oh, maybe I restarted my computer. <laughs> uh, I guess I restarted it. But, you know, there was great trades made off this yellow box right here just bouncing back and forth in that range so I don't see the difference in something like IWM versus Bitcoin right trade the range and if you're proven wrong then you got to just get out so if it drops below 30 you know I think that uh, for, for the vast majority if you are uh, fearful of the market then I would say you probably want to exit I will not be exiting my Bitcoin I will be keeping it um, I'm if, if uh, Michael Saylor is going to continue to buy billions and billions of dollars of it, I can keep a, I can keep my position open. Exactly, exactly, Big M. And it, you know, look, crypto haters, especially you got guys like Peter Schiff, and it's great. Um, I love when they were like, "Oh, Bitcoin dropped fifty percent." It's like, yeah, dude, it's up a thousand percent. I'm still up five hundred overall. You know, what I mean, when you get that kind of rationale. It's just the ebb and flow. And when you look at the long-term price point, long-term chart of Bitcoin, uh, I'll show you guys the monthly here as much as I can get with this platform. You know, uh, do you think that it was due for a pullback? Yeah, come on, man. Are you kidding me? Yeah, it was due for a pullback. The question now is where? Um, if we're talking fibs, you could say the retracement. We're getting pretty close to fib retracements here. Um, so yeah, I, I, there definitely could be more downside move, but I think long term it will be fine. Uh, let's see, Mary asks, so thoughts on EOS? Do you recommend keeping it? Is there a point that you would get out? Um, I don't really see myself selling any of my crypto. I'll be honest. I, I look at this as money that is just I'll keep it in there. Uh, I am bullish on EOS simply because when you look at the transactions, the the number of transactions that EOS can do, it's done more than any other cryptocurrency project out there. It's done more than Wax P. It's done more than Telos. It's done 87 million in its in one day was its record. 87 million transactions in a day. That's nobody's come close to that. And I have this belief in my mind that one of the ones that will walk away from this as the victor will be one of the ones that can compete with Visa as a transactional cryptocurrency. And EOS to me has a huge head start in there. I mean the number of transactions that they're doing is incredible. So I'm keeping that in my portfolio specifically for that reason. You know, I added Polkadot and more Cardano because those two are really going after the Ethereum market. And I think Ethereum is causing some problems of its own. So yeah, I think you're an opportunity to buy more. Look, I'm not a financial advisor and you got to assess your own risk. But if you look at the price point here, you know, it seems that it pretty much flatlined down around two bucks, right? Well, you're at 370. Is there a point where you say, all right, maybe I'll buy some at three? Yeah, it could. Um, it absolutely could. Could it go to zero? Yes. Again, everything can go to zero. It all depends on, on the development team, acceptance, security, etc. 
Um, Adam says, I own Ethereum, Cardano, and Stellar Lumens. Think they'll be okay? Yeah, I think so. Again, long term. Uh, I own all those, Adam, so full disclosure, I would probably be biased on those. But yes, uh, I have a small position in, I actually have, yeah, I think my Stellar Lumens and my Cardano positions are right around the same value. My Ethereum position is considerably larger, um, but again, I, I think Ethereum will do their 2.0. I think they'll convert over to proof of stake, uh, and when that's done, I think that there'll be a lot more attention on it from a transactional ability, and then the developers already said that they could go into um, sharding and other technologies to help improve the scalability. If that happens, then all of a sudden Ethereum becomes the number one contender again. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> yeah, Gregory, I gotta agree with that. Um, you are completely wrong. That's 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 actually one great use case. If you look at the list of use cases for Bitcoin, moving it from one country to another it is certainly a one. That's why El Salvador adopted it because the remittance payments that go through um, is a much faster, more efficient than using something like Western Union. Uh, let me actually check that one out. I haven't looked at Western Union. I know that the the, um, the the security dropped significantly um, based off that news. The Western Union Company, there we go. So here is the daily, ah, I'll bring it up for you guys. Here's the daily Western Union. This is, when you think about what El Salvador did, it basically says Western Union has been screwing us, right? Because they've been paying so many fees to do remittances and payments back to um, El Salvador. <laughs> Look at the price of, of Western Union when that was announced. I believe that was on the 10th, right? It was like a Monday the 10th or something like that. It's been just selling off ever since from 25 down to 23. Now it's not the end for Western Union, but you know, if you're an El Salvadorian and you have the option of sending money back home through Western Union and paying 15, 20% fees on that, and your person has to go down to those locations to get it, or I can use Bitcoin and just do it from my mobile device, uh, you know, that, that kind of changes the landscape there. So. So uh, yeah, I think uh, Western Union be a uh, uh, someone is getting to get hurt by this considerably. Mm -mm -mm. Well, you know the thing with with whether it's Peter Schiff or Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger, like everybody's got opinions about certain technology. And when we look at somebody like a Warren Buffett, it's easy to say, well, Buffett's right, Bitcoin's a scam. Actually, he's not as bad as Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger called it uh, the same thing as trading freshly harvested baby brains. But you know, the sad thing is, we look at what he's done and you say. Well, Buffett's got to be right because he's Berkshire Hathaway and they're worth you know billions and billions of dollars. I disagree with that. He has a specialty. He's got a business model that he works for him and he's extremely good at it. He has a history of not being very up to speed with technology or new technologies or innovations. He knows old school things, insurance. You know, can uh, what is it? Crispy, not Krispy Kremes, uh, Dairy Queen. You know that, that kind of stuff. Something he's, he's familiar with. He doesn't understand digital assets and cryptocurrencies. So, you know, there will be new investors down the road that will come into the scene and they'll have done very well with cryptocurrencies and someone will worship those guys. To me, it's the bottom line is about whoever you look at for financial advice or opinions and thoughts in the market, they should align with your belief systems as well. Um, you know, if their belief system is just making money, then we'll have to take your pick. All right, um, I was gonna end the show early today. Here is what we have for manana. Oh, by the way, I apologize. I was supposed to have Bill Addis on the show tomorrow and I realized that I told you guys once a month, I have to do a leadership meeting with OTA. So I no show tomorrow because it's a Tuesday and that's my meeting. So um, I'm not gonna have Bill Addis on tomorrow. I'm trying to get him to reschedule for Thursday, but I will have a show on Wednesday. So sorry guys, I know I, I love doing the show every day, but I, uh, I won't be doing one tomorrow, I'll be in a meeting. Here is what we have cooking for your economic announcements for tomorrow. Not a lot of, I mean, there's, there's a couple at the top that I am interested in, right? And that is the existing home sales. So they're expecting those numbers to drop. Remember, housing is really hot, 13% uh, year over year growth in the housing market. So I'd be, oh yeah, thanks Big Ab, thanks for reminding me. I'll look at that too. Um, so keep your eye on the existing home sales tomorrow. I think that is going to be noteworthy. You also have Powell testifying tomorrow, which is um, Gregory. Man, you know you you'd said some pretty weird things on the show before, but that right there is one of the dumbest things. It's if you if you use it for criminal activity, it is a 100% trackable blockchain. 100% trackable, meaning I know where every transaction is going. You know what's used for crime? Do you know what's used for drugs more than anything else? 
Open up your wallet, Gregory. It's your US dollar. Is the most illegal used currency on the face of the planet, whether you're talking terrorism, drug dealing, child pedophilia, you name it, it's US dollar. If you use Bitcoin as a ransom tool, you could not be a bigger idiot because it's totally trackable. So you're misinformed, Gregory. Just gotta throw that out there. All right, know your stuff before you start throwing comments around. Um, the Powell testimony, 11 a.m., be careful for that one, right? I think that one could be uh, volatile as well. Just because he already said his stance on inflation last week, he might change course a little bit because there's been uh, some some ire from the industry about his use and talking about inflation, he dropping the transitory piece as well. All right. Okay. Uh, so Big Ed wants to know about NVIDIA. N-V-D-A. Actually, let me go to my other platform. This one's easier for me to work with. NVDA. I didn't make the trade today, but I actually get some emails from people who did. Um, so congrats. Awesome. I'm glad you guys took the trade. It doesn't meet my criteria. Remember, my rules are pretty simple. Here's NVIDIA. I'll bring a line up here and we'll do snap mode. Um, the Amazon actually did meet my criteria, but I didn't take that trade. There it is. <laughs> I know, Medic. I know he is. So remember, my rule is it has to open somewhere up above that that line. And it, this is just my rules. This, and again, I know you, some of you took the trade, great. It just doesn't work for me. So it has to open up somewhere in that yellow box. If it opened up in that yellow box and then traded down below it, I could have taken the trade. It's just a simple rule to keep me from, keep me out of trades that have done me wrong in the past, right? So you notice that it opened up lower than that line and at no point did it cross above it. Now let's look at another one, which did, uh, but I wasn't watching it for a short trade. Here is Amazon. And we'll do snap mode again. And notice that Amazon today, it did open up above that line. It opened above it, rallied up, and then all of a sudden dropped. So this was actually met every criteria for a short opportunity per my rules. Now again, all of you have to have your own rules, okay? You have to um, be careful out there with, again, your decisions and how you approach it, but th that's my rule. So again, Big I'm glad you asked that. Yeah, it was no trade for me on NVIDIA. I, I was tempted, but you gotta, you gotta go with your rules, and my rules are there for a reason. Um, again, those rules have cost me a lot of money over the years, so I just drawed up my trading plan, and when I got, talk about candlesticks, I actually have in my trading plan a picture that draws the setup, both from a shooting star formation, which is what th uh, that one was, and a hammer formation. So it keeps me out of bad stuff. Uh, take that trade, but lay it's only, in, well, hey, 20 bucks better than nothing. Cool, um, I am gonna wrap it up for today. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Did you do a long call or verticals? I didn't do anything on those. I, I, I'm not really a big spread guy. I know I should be, but I just, I'm not. I'm really more directional or selling. So I still have my Amazon uh, puts on Amazon. Those were nice. It gets funny because I still have my um, my puts on the S&P, which obviously went down today, but it was offset by my calls on gold and my puts on uh, Amazon. So it was nice having a couple days of, of, of move, positive moves in my favor. That's right, Big Ep. Isn't that what it's all about? It's sticking to your guns and sticking to your rules. And it's funny because every time, like if I would have taken that trade today, I would have been cursing myself because I'm pretty sure I would have lost some money on it. It's like, that's the reason I put those rules in place. And again, we all have to come up with what our rules are, but that was mine. Happy to share them with you. All right, guys, that's going to do it for me. I'm going to wrap it up. Hope you guys have, oh, Katoot, yes. Uh, I didn't get a chance to email you, but I would definitely love it. Those shirts were awesome, by the way. I love that style. I love the Indonesian style of, of shirts. So I'm totally on board with that. Okay. Cool. That's going to do it for me, everybody. No show tomorrow. I apologize. So if uh, Brennan's uh, showing up tomorrow and he didn't get the message, hopefully we'll let him know. Uh, I wish I could have done the show, but I'll have to wait. I'll try to get Bill Addis on Thursday because there's a lot to talk about that reverse repo market and bond markets, interest rates and yields and the Fed. So I want to get Bill on. So I'll try to do that for Thursday. Uh, Wednesday, open for right now, but I'll be back on Wednesday to do a show. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you on Wednesday. Take care.